So, hi everybody, and welcome to my lockdown lecture. My name is John Slattery, I'm one of the academic members of staff in chemistry at York, um, and today I'd like to talk to you about ionic liquids. So as an academic, we get a chance to get involved in lots of different activities within the department. Of course, one of the things that we do is to teach our fantastic undergraduate students, but also many of us academics have independent research groups who are working at the cutting edge of science to try to understand some various different aspects of, of chemistry and push back the boundaries of knowledge in particular areas. So ionic liquids are an area which my research group are actively involved in looking at. Um, I'd like to share with you some of our um, interest and some of our activities in this area today. So um, ionic liquids are probably not something that you've come across before. So they're not that widely known outside of the research community. But you will have come across some materials which are very strongly related to ionic liquids. And that's ionic materials in general, so salts. So salts contain um, anions and cations. Probably the most uh, classic example of a salt that you will have come across in everyday life is sodium chloride, so table salt. Table salt is composed of sodium ions um, and chlorine ions packed together um, in, a, in a lattice, um, and we frequently encounter it as this um, solid uh, crystalline material. So a salt there, which we frequently encounter in the solid state. Not an ionic liquid, but a solid salt. So sodium chloride is obviously something that's really commonly encountered in our everyday lives and everyone will have come across it in a very kind of obvious form. Um, another salt that I wanted to highlight is something that we're actually all very close to and re is really uh, important for our everyday lives as well and that's something called lithium hexafluorophosphate. You're probably watching this video on a device that has some lithium hexafluorophosphate in it. So lithium hexafluorophosphate is used in uh, lithium ion batteries. So in a lithium ion battery, um, it's really important to be able to have lithium ions moving between the anode and the cathode and vice versa, depending on whether you're charging the battery or discharging it. Um, and the lithium hexafluorophosphate is an important component in that because it forms the um, electrolyte between the different electrodes, which allows those lithium ions to flow between the electrodes. So lithium hexafluorophosphate is something that we um, all encounter regularly as well. But again, this material is a solid under standard conditions. And of course, it's a solution when we use it as an electrolyte in batteries uh, when it's dissolved in some organic carbonate solvents. So salts are very commonly encountered, but we tend to encounter them as, as solids, and we tend to find that they have very high melting temperatures. However, if you take your sodium chloride and you heat it up to over 800 degrees C, it will melt and it will form a liquid. And these liquids that you form by melting salts have some very unusual combinations of properties. So if you think about salt and the properties of salt, it's odorless, it doesn't have any significant vapour pressure, so we can't smell anything coming off the salt. And so one of the properties is that these materials have very low vapour pressures. Uh, because they're made up of ions, they're also very highly conductive. And because the ions are often very stable, um, these materials are often very chemically thermally and electrochemically stable, so they're quite useful in, uh, in electrolytes type of applications. So if you take a solid salt and you heat it up uh, to make a liquid, um, you can form something called a molten salt, and so molten sodium chloride would be a molten salt. So uh, molten salts um, you may not have heard of either, but actually they're really important in everyday life, and they're used in a range of different applications. Probably the most commonly used application of molten salts um, is the use of cryolite, this is a sodium aluminium fluoride compound, as a solvent to dissolve up aluminium oxide and that's used to dissolve aluminium oxide ores prior to electrochemical reduction to form aluminium metal. So all of the aluminium that we come across in everyday life has been derived from a molten salt kind of process. So we encounter salts very regularly. In our daily lives we tend to encounter them as solid salts but if you heat these up to high temperatures, then we form liquid salts or molten salts, uh, which have lots of really interesting uh, properties and uh, useful applications, for example, in the production of uh, aluminium. However, if you heat a salt to 1000 degrees C, it takes a lot of energy, and we may not necessarily want to use these harsh conditions for all of the applications for a liquid salt. So what happens if we want to make a salt liquid at lower temperatures and get access to some of those really interesting properties from a liquid salt but at lower temperatures where we can actually start to do some very different chemistry to the chemistry that we can do at a thousand degrees C.
So if we look at the uh, structure of uh, a salt like sodium chloride, shown on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see that sodium chloride um, in the solid state is made up of ions, sodium um, and chloride ions, which are relatively small and relatively charge dense, and they're attracted to each other very strongly by Coulomb interactions between the, the uh, oppositely charged um, uh, ions. They also pack together very um, efficiently in the solid state to form this beautiful organized crystalline lattice. And this um, uh, effective packing and the strong interaction between the ions um, is the main reason why um, uh, sol salts like sodium chloride have relatively high melting temperatures because it takes a lot of energy to break down this organized, um, uh, strongly interacting lattice to form a, uh, a liquid material. So if we want to try and make salts, um, which we can uh, form liquids from at much lower temperatures, we have to try and overcome some of these uh, strong interactions in the solid state. And this is where we move from uh, molten salts to ionic liquids. So ionic liquids are essentially molten salts, but ones which have melting temperatures uh, which are relatively um, uh, low compared to the melting temperatures of molten salts. And the typical definition of an ionic liquid is a material which has a melting temperature of less than 100 degrees C. So how do we achieve um, relatively low melting temperatures um, in salt-like materials? If you have a look on the uh, right-hand side of this slide, you can see the chemical structure of a typical ionic liquid. This is 1-butyl, 3-methyl, imidazolium, bis, trifluoromethyl, sulfonyl, imide. That's quite a mouthful, so most people would just tip, uh, call this one beamium TF2N. So in a salt like beamium TF2N, what we've done is to take the, uh, the salt, make the ions bigger, and this reduces the Coulomb interaction between them, um, so the ions are less strongly attracted to each other, which means that we're going to reduce the amount of energy it takes to, separate, uh, to, to um, break down the solid uh, lattice and form the liquid. We've also made the ions much more asymmetrical, and this frustrates the packing in the solid state and, uh, um, again, uh, makes it easier to break down that solid lattice to form a liquid. And an ionic liquid like um, uh, beamium TF2N um, has actually reduced the melting temperature so much that these materials are actually liquid at room temperature. So on the right-hand side um, of the screen, you can see a, a bottle of an ionic liquid from our lab, um, which is just sitting at room temperature in the lab. It's a liquid at room temperature. So um, by changing the molecular structure of the ions, we can play around with the melting temperatures of these salts, um, and we can form um, ionic liquids which have um, uh, melting temperatures which are much lower than the molten salts, and which we can now um, uh, deal with um, as liquids at room temperature. Okay, so we've seen that by changing the structure of the ions involved in a salt, we can dramatically lower its melting temperature and produce salts which are liquid at or around room temperature. And it's these low temperature molten salts that we call ionic liquids. So I've got a, a sample of an ionic liquid here and you can see that this material, which is very similar to the one that I showed on the slide, um, is a liquid at room temperature. And this one's quite a nice kind of fluid liquid, so we can really deal with it in the liquid state at room temperature. So why are we interested in these liquid salts? Well, it turns out that although we've changed the nature of the ions involved in the salts, and we've dramatically reduced the melting temperature by doing so, the liquid state still has many of the properties that are associated with the liquid state of these molten salts. So we have low vapor pressures, for example. The salt is formed of ions, and so it's conducting. We have quite high chemical and thermal stability and good electrochemical stability. And these combination of properties um, are quite different uh, to the properties that we get from typical molecular liquids, like water or benzene. And so ionic liquids are liquid at room temperature, but they have properties that are different to many conventional liquids that we might encounter um, at room temperature. So we can use them in some uh, quite useful applications. So ionic liquids have now been studied in a range of different areas. They've found applications in sustainable chemistry. For example, you can use ionic liquids as solvents to replace conventional volatile organic solvents. And the low vapor pressures of the ionic liquids mean that these are much more difficult to lose to the environment by evaporation. So we can potentially reduce the amount of volatile organic solvent which is lost into the atmosphere. So ionic liquids, uh, because they're conducting, have found lots of applications in electrochemical applications. So for example, they've been used in uh, batteries, supercapacitors, solar cells, and things like this as well. Um, they're also used as solvents in catalysis, and this is one of the areas that we're interested in, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. So 
How did I get involved in ionic liquid chemistry? So I've been working with ionic liquids for quite a while now, about 15 years, and I came across ionic liquids really through a, a kind of chance encounter. So I was working at a university um, in Switzerland at that time, um, and we had a very famous a scientist from uh, Japan come to visit the university and give us a talk about his work on ionic liquids. And at that time, he mentioned in his talk that uh, people didn't really understand why ionic liquids were liquid at such low uh, melting temperatures. And that was a sort of fascinating thing to hear during a lecture. And afterwards, my supervisor and I sat down and, and had a, a talk about what he meant there. My supervisor was a very enthusiastic and fantastic scientist, and he got very enthusiastic about the idea that we could develop a quantitative model to try to understand why ionic liquids were liquid at such low uh, melting temperatures. And so we spent a couple of years working on this and we built up a model which hopefully will help people understand a little bit more about why ionic liquids are liquid and uh, how we might be able to predict which ones might be liquid in the future. And during that time, I learned a lot more about ionic liquids and found that um, I was really intrigued by their combination of different properties and by all of the range of different applications that they uh, had. And this made me want to learn more. And so um, I stayed in the field and kept learning about them. So the key thing about ionic liquids is that there are a very diverse range of liquids. So it's been estimated that there's you know, millions of different types of ionic liquids. And, and we've only made a fraction of these different types of materials now. Um, so there's still lots to make. There's still lots to, that we don't really understand about these liquids, so there's still lots to learn. And it's these factors that I'm really interested in about ionic liquids. So we're really interested in trying to understand them better, learn more about them, uh, and design new liquids that fulfill different roles within different applications. So for many of the projects that we get involved in, it's important for us to collaborate with other scientists working in similar areas all around the world. So, for example, we might collaborate with other experimental groups who perhaps have uh, access to specific pieces of equipment or who perhaps who've designed their own experiments to answer particular questions about the ionic liquid systems that we're interested in. But we also collaborate with uh, computational groups um, who can build computer models of the ionic liquid systems that we're looking at um, that help us to get a really interesting picture of the molecular basis of some of the properties that, we, uh, that we're seeing uh, from these computer simulations. And for me, working with other scientists all around the world being able to gain some uh, insights into what they do and uh, understand their techniques and learn a little bit more about uh, the areas that they're working in um, is a really important part of science and a really rewarding aspect of, uh, of doing research. As well as learning a little bit more about the, uh, the chemistry that people are doing, um, it's also really rewarding to, uh, to travel to different places around the world and to learn more about the cultures of those, uh, those places and the people working in those different areas. So as part of some collaborative work that we've been doing over the last few years, one thing that we've discovered about ionic liquids is that if we mix two ionic liquids together, we can actually change the properties of the ionic liquid by varying the different levels of the components that we put into the mixture. And this applies both in the bulk of the ionic liquid and also the ionic liquid gas interface that we're particularly interested in. And so we're just about to embark on a new collaborative project funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council that aims to take this work a little bit further, where we're going to expand the number of ionic liquid mixture combinations that we're looking at with the aim of trying to be able to rationally design the interfacial structure, the gas-liquid interfacial structure of these liquids, um, to be able to design ionic liquids that are particularly good for use in catalytic applications. So in particular, catalytic applications where uh, we have an ionic liquid uh, deposited onto a porous solid um, and a catalyst supported within the ionic liquid phase itself. So um, as part of this, we're going to undertake a new collaboration with some uh, fantastic scientists in Germany, uh, alongside some existing collaborations that we've been involved in for many, many years now. Um, and I'm really looking forward to kind of pushing this work uh, further forward and in, really interested in finding out what we can find out uh, about these new ionic liquids and to be able to develop some interesting new applications for them.